just goes against everything your mind wants to believe it's seeing because people shouldn't walk with lions, wild lions. It just doesn't really make any sense when you see it. This week's stories from Bondi Vet. I walk in and my first reaction is, where are they hiding the batteries? She cannot be real. She's ridiculous. It's, it sells for up to a million per horn. It's, it's ridiculous money. Africa, it's always been at the very top of my bucket list, but this trip is about more than sightseeing. I've been invited by some of the most amazing animal conservationists in Africa to spend some time over there, but also get hands-on with some of the most incredible animals on the planet. But, true to form, the plane leaves in two hours. I'm running late, so I better get going. After flying into Johannesburg, Chris's journey begins with a 100 kilometre drive to the Kingdom of the White Lion, a unique 2,000 acre conservation reserve. Just take a look at this. I reckon I'm about as far from Bondi as I could possibly be. I am about to go and meet a guy who absolutely intrigues me. His name's Kevin. He's known around these parts as the Lion Whisperer. He gets up and close personal to lions, but he wants me to get even closer, to operate on two of his lions. Now, for me, that is so far out of my comfort zone. It's still cats, right? Just big, aggressive cats. It's like he's walking a dog. The kingdom of the white lion is the vision of Kevin Richardson. 12 years ago, he fell in love with two cubs born in captivity. Now he provides a safe home for 41 lions, many of which he's bred and hand-raised. There's your my girl, and not my boy. You find it all right? I did. Good. You're, you're hard to miss, mate. Oh, not everyone does that, you know. <laughs> Well, meet Simon's pride. This is Simon. Hey, Simon. He's the, the chief in charge, really. So he's the one that eats combis. <laughs> Hence the Jeez. come on away from there. Uh, ta, 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 ta. Nicely. Good boy. Oh. He's a good boy. Yeah, the closest you've been to an adult. This is when he looks at me and there's there's actually no wire between me. And yeah, no, it's a different feeling, yeah, eh? It's a big window. And it's a big window, yeah. His head's yeah. Uh, ta, 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 ta. It just goes against everything your mind wants to believe it's seeing, because people shouldn't walk with lions. Wild lions. It just doesn't really make any sense when you see it. So for me, it, it just it blows my mind. Look at my face. Nice look. Not quite. While Kevin dreams of no lion living in captivity, the reality is the wild population is rapidly diminishing. Hey! Oh. Oh. My oh goodness, it's 40 degrees, do you have to lie on top of me? These definitely haven't lived the lives of a captive, you know, normal zoo kind of lion. They've, they've gotten to uh, be in the bigger areas, live in prides, fight for females, you know, roar at other lions over territories. So they live as natural life as I could give them in captivity. You know, so I'm in Australia, people go to zoos and look at the animals in cages. Here, it's sort of the other way around, isn't it? People are in cages here. Not by Gabby. Gabby. You are a terror. You are a terror. No. <gasps> ah! I've always thought, you know, if you gain the trust of an animal and get to know it on an individual basis, then the sky's the limit. Once you've formed a really good relationship, there's no reason why when that line gets to two, three, four, five, there's no reason why he should actually change his attitude towards you. What do you think when they see you in there? What do you reckon is going through their mind? These lions, they definitely know that I'm not a lion. So I'm always like this honorary member of this pride. What I find even more amazing than the fact they don't tear him apart is the fact they actually go so far the other way. They love him. They're all over him. They just want to be near him and, and be scratched by him and, and roll around with him. It's real affection. What can I do? I can't. <laughs> Thank you. Is that, a, is that what you call a lion hug? 
feels I'm interrupting. You're interrupting the love affair. Chris is about to become a lot more than an observer. There's been an outbreak of facial tumours in the Pride and Kevin has asked the Aussie vet to help out. We've had a recent spate of uh, uh, what, what's referred to as a sarcoid papilloma. They develop quite rapidly um, and they also seem to be quite contagious. Chris will be operating on two lines, Kevin's favourite Napoleon and the aggressive Maisha. That's got to be awkward for her, eating and, and yeah. you know, socialising with that. Yeah. The only trick is, is she's not a, a hand-reared line. <laughs> she's more of a wildish lioness that's grown up in this pride. Yeah. Um, so yeah, she'll take her hands off with you, if, if, even if I try and you know probe around on her lip. <laughs> You look at Napoleon, on his nose there. You see his nose? Yeah, yeah, oh, okay. That's the one I'm worried about as well. If there's any concern that he's not gonna get his nose back together properly or it's gonna be tricky, he is my baby, so daddy's gotta intervene here and <laughs> make sure what's best for baby. If there wasn't enough pressure about working on a line, he's <laughs> not just a line. He's the very reason Kevin does what he does, so it's um, a lot of expectation. As many times as I hear it, I never ever get sick of it. You cannot get sick of a lion roaring. It's absolutely incredible. For me, the sightseeing part of this journey out to see Kevin is all of a sudden gone. Now it comes down to work. Kevin really should be very well aware of the fact I've never operated on lines before. Now it's my time to impress. I hope I can. <laughs> Maisha and Napoleon need to be isolated in the shed so Chris can sedate them. When it takes all. When they walk past, I put a hide behind a brick wall so they don't see me. And jab her. When I jab in there, the needle stays where it is and this pushes in an injector. Can I be honest with you? Not a technique I've used before. Not a technique I've had to use before, but we're um spirit of adventure, we're gonna give it a go. Open rod. Yeah, Mason. Kevin is well aware of the risks involved. We've had a vet that was chomped because the lion tower wasn't sedated properly. That was a lesson learned. I should have mentioned that earlier on, hey, <laughs> before you came all this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The surgeries are tricky. They're in a delicate part of the body that bleeds a lot. Close! But what really freaks me out is the anaesthetic. After several nervous attempts... Better? Yeah, good one. Finally, success. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First job, okay. Let's go out to Nibu. Yeah, it's um, bending a bit quicker now, but um, I'm very happy to see an empty syringe there. And roll her into this? Yeah. Can you just tap her eye for me? The big test of whether Maisha was actually asleep was tapping her eyes. You normally just need one tap, but I think I was working on about 10 or 20, just to be sure. But 10 minutes later, Maisha is still not completely under. She's just a little bit light. She's, she's actually blinking when we tap her eye, so it's not really the, the state you want when we're about to actually cut into her. <laughs> what Chris doesn't know is that during the last operation here, a lion woke up and took a bite out of the attending vet's arm. I've seen things go wrong. You know, there's a lot of adrenaline in the air and everyone's hyped up and, and then, you know, you get a little bit anxious always when a cat goes under the knife. But I'm sure she's in capable hands. I'm, I'm assured, at least. There was a, there was a pause there. <laughs> I heard a pause. <laughs> now, I've done my research. I, go okay. I googled you. <laughs> really? Yeah. Got about 20 minutes or so, if that. It's conservative. Let's go. It's gonna be a cut, like a wedge, almost like a triangle to try to 
stick it in through this gum here. I'm doing Maisha first for a couple of reasons. First of all, her tumour is a bit more obvious. It should be a bit easy to get out. So in a way, it's a bit of a warm up to the main game, to Napoleon. I'm trying to get a good margin around the base of it and just avoid the fact that incisors is about an inch away from my hand. To Chris's relief, there are no complications during the surgery. Hmm. Okay, can we just get a check on this eye again? Good. Yeah. The reason I ask you about that is about your hands very clear. <laughs> your hands are very close to her jaws. With the tumour removed, he just needs to stitch the wound. What kind of knot do you call that? That one is called a simple knot. <laughs> Named after the surgeon that's uh, performing on it. <laughs> that devised it. Kevin is keeping a close eye on Chris's handiwork. It's going to make it look, look pretty, you know, because uh, she's got to find herself a guy one of these days and you know, no one wants to go out with a girl that, look, that looks like that. I'm actually really happy that that's actually come out really nicely and that the, the lips actually come back together quite cleanly and from here that, that swelling will actually subside and, and the great thing about this area is it has such a great blood supply it heals really quickly oh there we go do that wonderful all right this wakes her up thank you girl thank you I'm most obliging get the hell out of here that was really frantic I Actually, a couple of times I had to try to distract the guys and just sit with my gear, fumbling for syringes, just so my hands would stop shaking. There's a huge difference between Maisha and Napoleon, not just their size, but most importantly for me, it's their age. Maisha's three, Napoleon's 13. And with that comes a whole new range of risks with the anaesthetic. You just have to be so careful, because at that age, you could lose him. Much easier, huh? Yeah, good. Yeah between a tame cat and a wild cat. You can tell me one more time. Yeah, well, I'm going to just tell you one more time that this isn't just a lion. This is like a brother. So you, you are aware of that too. So. I know. I know. No, look, he's, he's a special cat. Huh? Each one of those scars represents something. I'm going to have one across here, am I? <laughs> things go bad. Yeah. Slowly, Napoleon is succumbing to the anaesthetic under Chris's watchful eye. Not only does this line mean so much to Kevin, this surgery is going to be incredibly difficult. We're dealing with an area that's not only very sensitive, but there's no give, there's no spare skin to enable me to cut the tumour out and then bring the skin back together and stitch it in place. Here is a real challenge. And then, there's a clock on me. Anyone that's had a, a punch in the nose or even a nosebleed knows that the, the nose <laughs> has a lot of blood. One little cut to the nose and, and they'll bleed and they'll continue to bleed. And this isn't just one little cut, this is a huge gash that we're having to make here. And get quite deep in and around this, this mass. The large amount of blood flowing into the wound is making the surgery difficult. Okay, so there it is there. The real challenge here is actually closing this wound here because you can see it's, it's big. It's about a centimetre and a half wide and about two centimetres long. And in an area like the nose, that doesn't come together easily or, or quickly. I just can't understand how you're going to do it. Over to you, Chris. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> but even Kevin is happy with the final result. Seriously impressive. Not done yet. No, it's looking really good. <laughs> Don't be so modest. <laughs> when you sign that line, you commit to becoming a vet and going to vet school, you, you don't ever for a second think that you're gonna be in a place like Africa operating on a big male lion like Napoleon. It's awesome. It's just not what you ever, ever planned for, but you're so happy it happened. So well done. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's my stress meter. Yeah, I know, I can see that. Yeah, that's, yes. that's registering high. So right this now. is like yeah. nine out of ten stress meter. Yeah, sure. Okay. Good job. Good job. <laughs> that's um. 
It was intense. It's just all on. I mean, awkward position, and I'm on my knees, lying down, and all the while there's just that big head staring right at you. And he's anesthetised, but those eyes look straight through you. So I know. Now the surgeries have been successfully completed, Chris has told the story about what happened to the last vet who came to the kingdom. You serious? A vet actually came here and got, got chomped on. Really? It's good, isn't it? That would have been in the, um, the column marked essential knowledge, but um, he didn't pass that on. Thank you. After the anaesthetic wears off, Maisha is demanding to be let out. That's a good boy. <gasps> but Napoleon boy. needs a lot more sorry, TLC. Boy. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but it's for your good. Yeah? Oh, it's actually looking very good. I mean, he's very sore. You can see he's feeling very sorry for himself. But he's a, he's a tough cat, huh? You've had worse than that in your life, my boy. It's time for Chris to head back to Johannesburg. But before he says goodbye, Kevin introduces him to some miniature Napoleons. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, you're scary, aren't you? Yeah, I bet. For you, is this where the relationship starts? Yeah, absolutely. If you're going to form a relationship with a lion, it, it, it really should start at this age. Even at this age, it's about enrichment. In captivity, you've got to, you know, tire or just keep them occupied all the time. Stimulate those little young minds. I am at my happiest when I'm with the lions because it is a way of me finding a sanctuary. <laughs> I've often said, and I really truly believe this, I would give it up like that to see wild numbers increase exponentially. If, if, you know, if they could just, if somebody could say, this is the magic, you know, um, formula, you've got to stop going in with lines, and then overnight lion numbers will increase, I'd do it like that, in a heartbeat. Oh, well, yes. As far as days as a vet go, I haven't ever had one where I've done surgeries on lions in Africa. So, I reckon I remember this one. Hey, little one. Hey, hey. Hi. Hey, Donna. How are you going? Great. How are you? Good. I walk in and my first reaction is, where are they hiding the batteries? She cannot be real. She's ridiculous. Her name is Quatili and she's being hand raised because her mum just ran out of milk. Quatili means regal princess in Swahili. She's the first cheetah to be born at the zoo in eight years and keepers Michelle and Donna are now the cubs' surrogate mums. We share a really special bond with Quatili. I've worked with Cheetah for a lot, a lot of years, uh, sort of focusing on them and their breeding. And uh, to finally have a one little Cheetah cub born is um, so special, knowing that they're so endangered. They're Africa's most endangered big cat. So to be able to spend time with a precious little Cheetah cub is, uh, makes you very thankful. That's a good girl. Today, Chris is getting involved in the daily training of the baby. And that includes meeting strangers, six foot five blonde strangers. She's handling me being here. Yep, she's doing very, very well. She's accepting that you're stroking her and it's not worrying her at all. And that's really good and important for us to do veterinary examinations on her in the future. There are big plans for this little one. The keepers are hoping that she'll become the poster girl for Adelaide Zoo. She'll educate the public about the plight of the cheetah, but she'll also do meet and greets with people. To do that, she's going to have to pass some tests. And Quatili's exams start today. Quatili. At Monato, Quatili is about to be road tested. The baby cheetah is earmarked to become a meet and greet ambassador at Adelaide Zoo. But she needs to cope with the one hour car journey and exposure to the public. Today is an incredibly big day. Um, we have been working very, very hard with a team of, of people to prepare Quatili for this process. So we're a bit nervous about how that's all gonna go. So if today's gonna go well, Zebby's gonna play a big part. Absolutely. Zebby <laughs> keeps Tilly calm during the car trip. Yeah. And this, 
<laughs> this is the ultimate karma. <laughs> Keeps it busy. Interesting mix. <laughs> Mothers at home with kids having trouble getting down to the local shops. Just need these. <laughs> so now we'll get her into the box. Yep. Guys nervous? <laughs> no, all good. Yeah, She'll be fine. Give you a calm face, yeah. I like it. <laughs> all right, Tilly, Tilly, come, come, come. Zebby's in there. Cool. So is this. Here we go. All right. And you got a big day today. You're leaving home for the first time. Clearly, Tilly's not one for nerves, but in the big scheme of things, today's big. So it's probably good not to waste any of that nervous energy right now. To travel with Quetili down to Adelaide Zoo can be a stressful situation because you've got an animal which is very much wild, very instinctual, put into a pet pack. Hearing noises and seeing trucks go past and things is different for her. So uh, yeah, we'll see how she copes with it. So if you just, yeah, preface her that way. Preface her? Yeah. Is her in? Yep. That way you can sort of sit in there with her and she can look out and be reassured by one of us. Okay, ready to go? We're ready. See you in Adelaide. This is really make or break for Quetili right now. If she freaks out in the car and can't make the journey to Adelaide, she just can't be a part of the program. In South Australia, Chris has arrived at Adelaide Zoo with the precious three-month-old Quartili. The baby cheetah has passed her first big test. You've got to remember, this is the first time that Quartili has ever left her home at Monato. She's a wild animal. It's not normal for her to be inside a car, but it's incredible how well she's handled it. Not missing home yet, are you? Now, an even bigger test. How does she handle a totally new enclosure? How are you going? How are you going? Welcoming committee. Yes, I'm the welcoming committee. <laughs> Thank you. Today, Quartili is auditioning for a role as an ambassador at the zoo, where she will interact with the public. But she needs to cope with the new environment. You guys ready? Sure. Yeah. This nervous? is it. <laughs> so what we're looking for is her to walk out and just be calm, prowl around, but just generally seem quite happy. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Here we go. Here you go. Hey. Straight between the legs. <laughs> <laughs> it was the quickest way. Yeah. <laughs> She's loving that. So if she was stressed, she wouldn't be playing. No. Yeah. She's having a, a wonderful time. She's taken fabulously. She's running around like a little cheetah should at this age and playing and having a ball and totally relaxed. The crucial thing here is that she's able to follow and really listen to her keepers. It's almost like a cheetah version of puppy training, but if they don't get it right now, then when she's fully grown and really able to cause some damage, it could get really dangerous. Tilly, come, come. All right, and now ask come. her to sit. Sit, sit Tilly, sit. The reason that we're doing the training is so that people can get up close and personal with this cheetah, so that she will sit and she will come when we call her and we can allow people then to go in with her and, and have a wonderful experience um, of meeting a, an endangered species. I said good dog, that's awkward. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly the same as dog training though, isn't it? <laughs> I'm sorry, Tilly, you're very different. Quartili is following those commands really, really well. I mean, you have to remind yourself that she's a cheater. She put some two hours to shame. Quartili. Quartili. If she was to go on to become uh, an ambassador for Cheetah, I have no worries that she would be awesome and be a little star for sure, <laughs> because um, she already is. She's just fabulous. You look at Quetili and she's still so young and so innocent and so naive to the problems that the rest of the species is facing. But you look at her and you realise they've got a pretty good ambassador there.
Chris has travelled to the vast Shamwari Game Reserve on the southern coast of South Africa. He's been invited to be part of an important elephant conservation program. We would not believe it, but we're going to make an elephant asleep. It's all happening now. Chris is joining doctors Johan Hubert and John O'Brien, and the bull elephant they're searching for today is young, fertile and dangerous. We, uh, we, we need to dart him, basically, with a dart gun. Uh, so we anaesthetise the animal, and then we need to do some contraceptive work in it. Is it still up here? Yeah, but it's out in the open. You see, when you dart, when, when we dart, you know, what we really got to consider is it can take 10, 15 minutes for the animal to go down. Sure. They can also move a long way in that period yeah, yeah. of time. So we don't want to do it where it's right, even in the open, but with thicker all around, you yeah. know. You can safely assume that this elephant isn't going to want to have its contraception or have a blood sample taken. And when you're talking about something that's the size of a small truck that can charge you, we have to be so careful here. Is that him? Okay, this is, this is in Chris. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay, this is this is in Chris. Wow. At the Shamwari Game Reserve in South Africa, Chris and the team have spotted the young elephant. This is a bull we're looking for. Yeah. You'll see he's got a nice big tear in the top of the right ear. This 20-year-old male has been singled out for contraception. There's no doubt that the poaching and killing of elephants has been a huge problem throughout Africa. But in recent years, certain pockets have found their numbers have gone through the roof. Now they're left with two options. You either kill the elephants or use contraception, because if those numbers stay the same, it's just too damaging on the environment. All right, now you see he's on the bank of the river, yep. and he's going to follow a road that runs parallel to the river. My recommendation is we let him walk yep. to get into the open area on the other side, sure. and we dart him there. Yeah. So the risk is that if we do it now, that river could be where he heads. So absolutely. If he had to get drowsy and, and actually go down to the river and mm. fall in, he'll, he'll drown. It's crucial the team gets close enough to dart the elephant so the contraceptive can be administered. But they don't want to spook him. As with anything, humans, animals, there's this uh, comfort zone. Mm. If I had to go too close to him, yeah. he would feel that and he'd get grumpy. He'd either run off or he'll turn around and say to us, back off, you know? All of a sudden, the elephant starts heading away from the river. And Chris now urgently needs to get ready to dart him. Okay, Chris, would you like to pressurise yeah. and then load it? Yeah. So the plan is what, just to wait here and see if he heads into an open space there? Yes, and I think once we pressurise, I'll go around so that I'm in the open area itself. Yep. There are a couple of challenges here. I mean, first of all, elephants have incredibly tough skin, so you need to be able to penetrate that with a dart. But you don't want to use so much force that it actually causes injury to that leg. This you can go to the middle of his backside, eh? Yeah. Okay. This is a better position now. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite nice. It's in the open area. Okay. Um, hopefully it won't run too much once we dart it. Right. I'm going to go a bit forward just so that we can get a better shot of his shoulder because yeah. the wind moves the dart quite a lot. Yeah. Okay. The fact is, I've got one shot at this. If something goes wrong, he could turn and charge, and from that distance, a dart ain't going to stop him. That was a perfect placement. Didn't yeah. like that at all. Looks like it has fired. You agree? Yeah, I think so. Johan's checking to see. Did yeah, it go it's fine. The plunger is down, yeah, so it's fine. Okay. He's not happy. Chris is working alongside the reserve's vets, Dr. Johan Uber and John O'Brien. Now the elephant has been darted, it's a waiting game for the tranquilizer to take effect. He seems a little bit agitated too. You can see he's spinning around and, and shaking his head and flapping his ears. Even though it was only two millions of, of anaesthetic, you can see just how powerful it is. There he goes. The bull is finally down, but has fallen awkwardly, and now he's in grave danger. Because of the big stomach, you know, the what pressure of the in? diaphragm, we need to get them sideways. So essentially right. crushes his own, own lungs. Yeah, yeah. We've got a bit of a problem here. I mean, the way he's sitting like a dog, it's fine for so many other animals, but for an elephant, it means tons and tons of weight are pressing down on his lungs. The fact is we now need to roll him onto his side, otherwise we risk losing him. 
It will be impossible for Chris and the other two vets to move the four-ton elephant, so reinforcements are called to help. OK, we need you to come in as quick as you can, please. Yeah, I am coming. All right. I think we can get out now and check. Yep. The big bull is in trouble, and suddenly... Chris? Sorry, there's elephants running up behind. Okay. Sorry, guys, back on the vehicle, please. So is the team. Yo, Anya, Anya, stay behind it. Let it go past us, please. The problem we've got right now is that he's sitting in a dangerous position. We need to roll him onto his side. That's where these guys come in. But the problem is that this elephant over here that's circling and looking quite agitated too. We need to get to that one, but we can't because of that one. At the Shamwari Game Reserve in South Africa, Chris and the team anxiously need to reach a tranquilised elephant. The problem we've got right now is that he's sitting in a dangerous position. We need to roll him onto his side. That's where these guys come in. But the problem is that this elephant over here that's circling and looking quite agitated too. It's all happening, huh? The intruder suddenly loses interest. He is going to join up with the herd. Yeah. So you'll go into the bushes. I think we can actually drive a bit closer. Yep. Uh, just so we've got the vehicles there for safety. Mm -hmm. All right, Bruce. We're going to stop putting him over. Finally, they can get to the tranquilised elephant. Wow, it's incredible. Time is critical. If the huge beast isn't moved quickly, its lungs will be crushed. There's the dart there. You can see the plungers are up to the top, so he does actually have all of those drugs on board. So that's a comforting sign when you've got this many people around an elephant. It's time to get this elephant on his side, and that means all hands on deck. But the massive beast won't budge. There's only one other choice, bring in the car. It's time to exchange manpower for horsepower. Dead with more Bruce. In South Africa, Chris and the team are urgently trying to roll the tranquilised elephant onto its side. There's only one other choice, bring in the car. It's time to exchange manpower for horsepower. If they can't manoeuvre the elephant, it's at risk of crushing its lungs. Get a bit more, Bruce. Hey, whoa. Nice and gentle. Well done. It's amazing. He's fully out now. All right. Okay, so you can hear the air rushing out of this trunk here. This is how he's going to be breathing right now. So just so he can breathe and keep him stable, we just need to keep that nice and straight. All right, so blood samples first. Yes, yeah, just flap it completely over. There we are. Oh, it's a big <laughs> so what we do is we close the eye. And you've got quite a nice vein to take blood from, eh? With the elephant stable, it's time to perform some blood tests. If I miss that, there are serious <laughs> problems, aren't they? <laughs> the whole point of this blood test is to measure his testosterone levels. That's the hormone we're trying to suppress, so we need to know its levels before he has the contraception. So it's almost for two reasons why we're doing this. It's the one that we want to suppress testosterone for the behaviour, and the other is almost like trials that we do to see if this is a way of contraception uh, that we can use. If trials are successful, more bull elephants will be given contraception. This will help control herd numbers in parts of South Africa where they simply can't sustain so many elephants. He's a bad boy. He's actually quite a bad boy, quite a naughty one, yeah. We were actually quite fortunate to get him in the open like this. Yeah. This might just pull him back into line. <laughs> With the blood testosterone level determined, Chris can work out exactly how much contraceptive vaccine to give this young bull. Right, so, in the elephant world, it's the male that goes in the pill. So, he's just going to get five mils of this drug here. The whole point of this injection is to essentially stop any of that alpha male aggressive or dominant behaviour, but also importantly, it's going to stop him from breeding. Okay. 
now that all our work here is done, it's time to wake him up with a reversal agent. Now, I've been caught out in Africa before with animals waking up just a little bit quicker than I thought, so we're not going to take any chances here. OK, thank you. No Let's go. OK, thank you. No Let's go. In South Africa, a massive bull elephant is about to wake up after being given a contraceptive. It's not going to muck around. Within seconds, his eyes are open. He's waking up quickly, but not quite as quickly as a rhino I treated on my last trip to Africa. Okay, okay. Watch out, watch out. Some... The rhino woke up far quicker than anticipated, and Chris had to make a run for it. Yeah, I'd go. Thank you, I'd go. Luckily, the rhino called off the chase. Oh. Oh, I've got some oxygen. He's going to get up, eh? Here we go. Yeah, big boy. There we go. It doesn't muck around. There's something majestic and almost spiritual about watching a four-ton elephant rise to his feet and really become the king of the African savannah once more. And then it kind of changes the purity of the moment. He's quite relaxed. So all, all's well that ends well, eh? Yeah. It's just incredible. It's like nothing happened at all. He's back on his feet and, and ready to go. And, all right, away he goes. Mate, thank you. That was very special, Johan, thank you. That was a pleasure, thank you, mate. Sure, he gave us a few heart palpitations, but to be this close to the biggest of the big five has been a real privilege. But also to be able to help out a species that has been under so much pressure is something I'll never forget. Um, everybody ready? Here we go. Okay. Here we you go. jump with us, yep. so if you guys come with us. All right, Hayden, let's go. At the Maholo Holo Rehabilitation okay. Centre, Chris has been asked to join uh, in a mission to microchip a wild rhino. So if he doesn't like what's going on, he's going to, he's going to charge? He, he might. He Conservationist might. Brian Jones, who runs yeah. this oasis for endangered yeah. animals, knows the risks involved. Uh, if he did come, we'd have to run for our lives and get in the vehicle. And I've had them smash the vehicle a couple of times. They put their horn, fortunately, they put their horn underneath and lift the vehicle up. So it's only the, the back horn that punches a hole. Cody, Cody, we on our way now, Cody. Standing by. Poaching of rhino is something you hear occasionally about in Australia, but in Africa at the moment, it is the news story because last year, 330 were killed. We're not talking small money for this rhino horn. We're talking about $50,000 a kilo. And in an adult full-size rhino, there's about five kilos of horn in each rhino. That's a quarter of a million dollars. Chris and the team are searching for two rhino brothers. Do you right, Nick? Do you right? OK. It's the smaller of the two males who still needs a microchip. That's him there. The first problem is getting close enough to the rhino to sedate it with a dart. I'm now at the perfect distance to fire, but the reality hits me. If I get this shot wrong, she's gone. There'll be no second chance. All the while I've been thinking, I'll have some time for this shot. I'll be able to get myself prepared, focused, get the target right. All of a sudden, Hind says, go now, must go now. And it's on. Before I can enjoy the relief of landing that shot exactly where I wanted it to go, he's taken off. And it doesn't look like he's coming back. A bit stressed about us being around. Made a run for it. The worry is that the drug hasn't kicked in yet, so. And he's going to drop at some stage, but it might be, might be miles away. It's following some tracks and they're going through this way. You wouldn't think it'd be possible to lose something as big as a rhino, but that's exactly what's happened. But thankfully, what have we got? Heinz tracking skills. The guy's incredible. He's looking at the dirt. He just sees things that I can't even see and goes, not this way, it's gone that way. And all of a sudden, we're getting close to that rhino. You see the big one? Yeah, here's the other one. 
Go ahead. Time now alerts Brian to their location. Okay, I'm just uh, southeast of you. Let's just keep our eye open for the other one, eh? The other one ran away towards the mountain, but just keep our eye open, ears and eyes open. He's stumbling around, so certainly made him a mobile. They stand and sleep like horses, and then at some stage they go down. Chris and Hyde are now carefully approaching the sedated rhino. There is still a risk it could turn and charge. To be that close to a rhino, it's one of the most dangerous animals in the world. It's this weird mix of exhilaration and absolute terror, all at the same time. At the Maholo Holo Rehabilitation Reserve, Chris and Hine are cautiously approaching the wild rhino they need to microchip. Oh, just watch out, the other one is just running away here. Yeah? Oh, okay, that's fine. Hey, it's going down here. I see there's some blood. There's a hole here. The sedation from a dart gun has now immobilised the massive animal. Just extraordinary. Brian and his team have been given the all clear to bring in the equipment for the dangerous procedure. It really hits home for me when you're here and you see those animals and you look into their little eyes and they're caught up in the middle of this war and they don't really know why they're involved. What they use the horn for is, is honestly a, a bit of a mystery as far as scientists are concerned because it's claimed to have every benefit from being an aphrodisiac to helping arthritis to uh, people even claiming it cures cancer. It's, it sells for up to a million per horn. It's, it's ridiculous money. It costs them their life and they, they pay the ultimate price. They're getting ruthless. They game with GPSs. They game with international cell phones. I was told to arrange it in the park when I was there now. And they said, Brian, they have a scout that goes out first. He finds a rhino. He hones him in with the GPS. They shoot it and move out. And in two days, the horn's in China. It's a, it's a one on war. Yeah, he's still nice and pink there. The drilling has started. So the tiny microchip can be placed in the horn. This male's actually very close with the other bigger male and he's just been lurking around the bushes over here, so his constant concern is the fact that he's just very close by. He's not liking what we're doing to his mate, and he could charge any minute. The hole's nice and clear, so it's ready for the chip now. This is a medical procedure with a huge purpose. The idea of getting that microchip into that horn means that it can be tracked anywhere in the world and know exactly where it's come from, and that's the big step in trying to really rule out this horrific crime. 4B7F7 seven seven Alpha 2033. We've microchipped him, we've vaccinated him, we've, we've marked him, we've taken DNA samples, vitamin injections. Really, the whole works is done right here and right now. Now we've done everything really just up to this injection just to reverse this anesthetic and, and then he should hop up and continue on his life a bit safer than he was before. It will be only minutes before the rhino wakes up and the team needs to clear his departure path. You're going to wake him up, get ready to run. If you can climb a tree without thorns, good luck. OK, let's go. Let's go, let's go. Watch out, watch out. Honestly, when I gave that reversal, I thought, got a couple of minutes here, we can amble away. Uh-uh. He woke up straight away and meant business. The rhino is still groggy, so he's crashing over rocks and then barges through a tree and then turns around and looks at me. I'm thinking, no, mate, just keep on going the way you're going. But no, he runs straight at me. Yeah, I'd go. I'd go. So I do the courageous thing and run fast. I'm sure you're having a great laugh, but when that rhino is running at you, it's very, very scary. Trampled by a rhino. Interesting way to go. I've got some oxygen. Chris is good. No, no, he, he's a natural. But he's in the wrong place. He should be in South Africa. That was very special, so thank you. No, well, mission accomplished. Yeah. If you guys loved that video, great. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel below. That way.